Okay, we've, uh, we've given the, the premise for the book. Paul wrote this book um, from Corinth on his first missionary journey, writing back to the Thessalonians, where he had planted a church you can read about in Acts 17. It was a church that was planted with some opposition and persecution, and it was a troubled uh, church. And Paul encourages them deeply through the letter he writes to them. He was only in Thessalonia for perhaps about a month. And during that month, on the Sabbaths and through the week, uh, he was teaching them, certainly encouraging them in the important Christian principles of living, but also with an emphasis on the return of Christ. There was much teaching relating to that end times timeline and the Antichrist and the rapture and the return of Christ and these types of um, principles, which is part of our gospel, by the way. And it's important for us to note that this was a brand new church. This was a young church. They had only been uh, assembled together as brothers and sisters in the church for some weeks. And Paul was teaching them these deep truths on the end times. And some Christians might say, oh, this is too deep for me. I don't understand the end times. Well, we need it from the time for when we're first believers all the way to the end. We need this teaching because it is part of the gospel. Some might say, well, I, I don't understand it. And I, 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 I agree, sometimes there are subjects that are quite difficult to grasp. And someone said to me, oh, I feel like 30% of that message I didn't understand. And I said, but you, did you understand 70%? How about that? How about what we do understand, what we are growing in, what we do rejoice in? Don't get lost in the vocabulary and all. Just let God minister to you and teach you uh, on your journey. Amen? So let's, let's uh, remember that. The end times teaching, it's a little bit like painting by numbers. I, I visited the art group the other day and I was looking over someone's shoulder and maybe the picture's not clear, but painting by numbers or painting, slowly it comes into focus. And that's like this type of teaching. And it's so be excited about your journey of learning. Don't switch off, don't shut off, but open up and say, okay, Lord, here I am. I am your student. I'm your disciple. I have your spirit. Here is your word, and please teach me. And slowly it will come into wonderful focus. And there is a blessing in it, isn't, isn't there? Revelation 1.3 said, blessed are those who study the word and those who hear the word. There is a blessing when we teach end times subjects together. 25% of 1 Thessalonians is prophecy. 40% of 2 Thessalonians is prophecy. Someone said to me the other day, oh, I've never heard 1 or 2 Thessalonians taught before. That's one of the reasons. It's a challenging subject. Many churches would rather not teach it. And uh, so we're on the journey of understanding. I could go and find a church that doesn't teach it. Maybe that's easy. But isn't it better to, to come and trust that God will guide us and teach us in this important subject? So, at the end of every chapter in 1 Thessalonians, there are five chapters. How many? Five chapters. At the end of every chapter, there is a phrase relating to the end times. So what I'm going to do this morning is we're going to go through each one of those phrases and paint a picture regarding the return of the Lord. So here we go. The first phrase at the end of chapter 1 that we've already studied uh, together starts in verse 9. And it says, For they themselves declare concerning uh, uh, to us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven out to, who comes out of the heavens, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the first phrase relating to the return of Christ. And Paul speaks to these Thessalonian believers and he says, listen, you are, you've turned from idols, you are serving the living God and you are waiting for him. And this is an active waiting with an anticipation, with a looking, with a yearning. Uh, Romans 8 speaks about a groaning 
in, in that anticipation, waiting for the day of redemption. We see a similar parallel in Titus. I'll read you the verses in Titus 2, verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Listen to this. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He speaks about, listen, the gospel came to you in word, in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with much assurance. And now you are those who are serving and waiting. Or as it says here, looking for the blessed hope. Looking, waiting, yearning for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he says, because of that, you are living, living soberly and righteously. Why? Why would a Christian live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world? Because of religion? Because of morality? Because he's living before people? Or because he has a living hope and he is waiting for the return of his Savior to come in glory and return to this earth? That's what it says here. And here is an important principle, that the teaching, or, or more importantly, let's say, the reality that Christ is coming back has or should have a profound effect on the believer's life. When we are quickened again and again to this reality, it should, it must affect our life. We are not sleeping, but we are waiting, we are awake to something. This is what it says in 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of the Lord, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. You see that? Notice that. He who has this hope purifies himself. There is a purifying effect of believing and having the assurance of his return. It says in Luke 12, 35, to be dressed in readiness. What a wonderful phrase. To be dressed in readiness. Be like men who are waiting for their master when he returns from the wedding feast so that they may immediately open the door to him when he comes and he knocks. Now, the question is, is he going to come back in our lifetime? Hello? I don't know, do you? We don't know. But honestly, I was considering this last night. It's not the point. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean, it matters. But it doesn't, it's not, the important point isn't whether he comes back in my lifetime or not. The important point is to be dressed with readiness. It's to live in anticipation, yearning and longing for that day. Whether he returns in my lifetime, in a sense, is incidental. How I live my life should, should be one that reflects a living hope and an expectation. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 Let us not sleep. Is that, I don't know, is there anyone sleeping this morning? <laughs> let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch. And be sober. First Peter 1.13 Therefore prepare your minds for action. Be sober in spirit. And rest your hope fully. Oh, what a phrase. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amazing. Ooh, anticipation. That day on the horizon, on the timeline. A uh, future prophecy is, fu is future history. Is history just waiting for time? There's no question mark there. It's going to happen. We believe that fully. And notice this. What, what are they waiting for? To wait for his son. Not an event or a time or the rapture, although those things are important. 
but primarily waiting for him, waiting for a person, waiting for our Savior, waiting for the glorious uh, Redeemer to return to the earth. The Savior himself is coming. We're not waiting for the end of the world or the judgment or the Antichrist and all those things that they will happen. But primarily it's about him. The object of their hope was Jesus himself. In 1 Timothy 1.1, Paul says, Jesus Christ, our hope. Many get lost on the timeline. When is this going to happen? These judgments and this rapture and the Antichrist, the revealing. And, and that's important. Don't get me wrong. You know how I value that. And I think it's important that we teach it. And we want to grow an understanding of it. But don't get lost there. That's not the important focus. Just get lost in the wonder that he is coming back. In the wonder that he has a redemptive plan on the earth. The last verse in Revelation says, Oh, I am coming quickly. And the response of the bride or the believer is even so, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Interestingly, at the end of Song of Solomon, that beautiful book that typifies the relationship of the believer and God or the church and Christ, the last verse says, Make haste, my beloved. Be like the gazelle or the young stag on the mountains. At the last verse of Song of Solomon, the last verse of Revelation, the last verses in every chapter in Thessalonians, there is this anticipation, this expectation, this yearning, which would be in the heart of every spirit-filled believer. We say, oh, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come. We have that faith that rests in him. So the Thessalonians were serving God the Father in verse 9, and here they are waiting for the Son from heaven. And it says, even Jesus, whom he raised from the dead, and of course his resurrection, an all-important prerequisite to his return and to his future reign, an undisputable proof of his deity, that he was who he said he was and who the scriptures said he was. Even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now this is where you need to sit up and pay attention. Okay? Delivers us from the wrath to come. Now we need to look at a timeline, so follow with me. On this timeline, first of all, we had the Old Testament period. And then the fulfillment of prophecy, the coming of Christ at his first coming. With me so far? We've got that part, right? And that's followed by the church age, where we are now. The Bible teaches that the end of the church age, or the end of the age, if you like, will end with a special seven-year period which we will focus on in just a moment, right? So there's the church age, the future history. It will end with a very important period of seven years. After which Jesus will return to the earth. And after which he will set up his kingdom, a literal future kingdom on the earth, depending on what camp of theology you're in, that's mine. So... That seven years is an important focus. Let's take a moment and look at the seven years together. This seven-year period, which is often we divide it into two, three and a half periods, the first and the second half, because certain things uh, happen there. In the first half, we know it begins with the covenant. We've taught on this before. There's the first seal judgments, the first four at least. They're the four horsemen of the apocalypse, etc. That happens in the first half. But it's the midpoint of this seven years that something monumental happens. It gets the full attention of Paul the Apostle, of Daniel the Prophet, and of Jesus himself, who refers to it as the abomination of desolation. But it's the revealing of the Antichrist. It's at this point, halfway through the seven years, that this this 
political figure will rise to the world stage, unifying some nations, causing conflicts and also peace with certain ones and alliances. But at the halfway point, breaking the covenant that he made at the beginning, he will reveal himself for who he really is. That will be followed by a period called the Great Tribulation. You can read of this in order in Matthew 24. After those days, gee, after that, Jesus says, will be great tribulation on the earth. This is when that, that man of sin, the Antichrist, that political figure, will unleash unbelievable persecution on all believers and Christians and particularly the Jewish people. There will be great suffering and tribulation and bloodshed also in that time. That is followed by a period called the wrath of the Lamb, where Jesus, his, uh, these, are the, these are the trumpet and bowl judgments, don't worry about that, but judgments that will be unveiled that are an expression of the wrath of the Lamb. Now we think of the Lamb meek and mild, saying nothing, going to the cross. But here is the wrath of the Lamb. And that wrath will be poured out on the Antichrist and all of the armies of the Antichrist that have um, uh, uh, assembled themselves against the Lord's anointed. And it will bring an end to that great tribulation. And of course that is followed, it's in, you can't see it very clearly, maybe the second uh, coming. Uh, itself. So let's lose the colors there, and we can see that timeline, right? Those second three and a half years, there's a lot happening there. And by the way, we're going to have an end time seminar in August. We'll spend some more time unpacking this. But we are told that we are delivered from wrath, right? And that happens by what's called the rapture. Now, there's some different theological camps on when this will happen, but don't get lost on that. There's some room for disagreements. It's okay. But when will the rapture happen is a good question. But one thing we can all agree on, whatever camp you might be on on the rapture, we will be raptured before the wrath of the Lamb. This is what our verse says. Even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come, now, some scholars teach that. That's a general sense that because he died on the cross for us, we are delivered from the wrath against our sin. But in the context of Thessalonians, particularly chapter 4 and chapter 5, it seems more that it is clearly referring to a specific time when his wrath will be poured out on the earth during that seven-year period. And the coming of Jesus, the Greek word parousia, it means the coming or the presence we often think of the Lord's coming something that will happen in a moment and finish in a moment. But the parousia includes what we would call the rapture, which is where Jesus will come and remove the church before the time of wrath, and includes his full second coming where he will return to the earth to set up his kingdom. So when will the rapture happen? Oh, there's another verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. God did not appoint us to wrath but to obtain salvation. So as we consider this timeline, one thing we can agree on is that the church will be removed from the earth before the wrath of the Lamb. Now, depending on what view you might have, um, there are some who hold to what's called the pre-tribulation view of the rapture, which is, is that we, the church is removed at the beginning of seven years. Uh, I used to believe that because I was taught that as a, a, a younger Christian, but I have changed my position on that now. Um, there are some who are called the mid-trib uh, uh, position or view, which the church is removed at the midpoint. There are others who are referred to as the post-trib believers, that the church will be removed at the end of the seven years. And then there are lastly those who... Oh, wrong one. There are those who refer to themselves as the pre-wrath camp, which is what I ascribe to now. But again, uh, everyone be persuaded in your own mind. The point is, the important point, is that that last generation of believers, whenever that will be, whether it's now or hundreds of years from now, that last generation of believers, it seems, uh, will uh, taste 
some of what we're talking about today, but be removed before the wrath of the Lamb uh, takes place. In Revelation 6, I'll read to you. <clears throat> it says, And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks and on the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? This is what's referred to by the term, the day of the Lord, which is an incredibly common, repeated phrase, echoed all through the Old Testament. This time of coming judgment on the earth, which will precede the coming of the Messiah. Or we could say the second coming of the Messiah. In chapter 7 after it speaks about the wrath of the Lamb, we see this view of a multitude that were without number, that could not be counted, wearing white robes around the throne in heaven. And someone in that arena asked the question, who are these who are wearing white robes? And the answer is, it is those who have come up out of the great tribulation. So based on that, uh, it can be concluded that the rapture happens before the wrath of the Lamb, and they are the ones that are seen caught up in heaven around the throne. So, that's, that's, uh, that sets us up now to look at the last phrases. So you have the, uh, the structure now. Let's, let's, uh, let's move on. The second phrase at the end of chapter 2 says, For what is our hope? Our joy, Paul says, or what is our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming, the parousia? For you are our glory and our joy. And what Paul is alluding to here is a, another special event that will take place at the rapture, which is also the resurrection of New Testament believers in Christ, where there will be a time of reward. This is known as the bema seat, the Greek word bema or reward seat. You can read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, is it 5 verse 10, I think it is, where it says we all must appear before the bema seat, or there it says judgment seat. But the focus is not judgment, but it's reward, that we will be rewarded accordingly to that which was done in faith. And Paul's alluding that to that here recognizing that there will be a reward. He says, what, what, what is, what, who is our crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you, Thessalonians, that at that day we will rejoice in, in our labors and how God uh, blessed them? Let's look at the third phrase at the end of chapter 3. And, may, and here, this is a prayer that Paul has in light of the second coming. And may the Lord make you an increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. So, we are not to be stagnant or stationary or static or passive or coasting. That's not what this verse says. It says that we are, we are in a pro progress of sanctification, that we are to be made uh, blameless in holiness in our hearts. In other words, there is a progressive continuing work of sanctification taking place in the believer's hearts. And by faith, we respond to the work that he desires to do in us. And when the result of that is that we are changed. We are turned. We are sanctified. We are not perfect, but we are, we are blameless. We are growing. We may not be sinless, but we sin less by his grace and by his spirit. So that's Paul's prayer, that the Lord would make you increase, that he may establish your hearts blameless. It's sanctification. It's not a work that you do for God, but it's a work that he does in you or in available vessels. Let's go to the fourth phrase at the end of chapter 4. And this is a slightly longer passage. 
He says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. And that's a good point, isn't it? Paul says to the church, any pastor would hope and have this towards his church. I don't want you to be ignorant. That's why we we labor through this. That's why these rings are under my eyes. Because I don't want you to be ignorant. And I don't want to be ignorant. But we want to be growing in our understanding and in our faith. Because the Thessalonian church, they were going through some troubles. They were questioning what's hap- what happens to our loved ones who have died in Christ and died in faith, and now they are buried. Have they missed the resurrection? And so Paul writes to the Thessalonians, and he addresses this question. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now, Concerning those who have fallen asleep. Did you know that the word cemetery comes from the Greek word that is used here as a place of sleep? Isn't that interesting? And I love that because the metaphor suggests that in the same way that someone will ultimately awake from sleep, and you might find that hard to believe if you have a teenager, But just as someone will awake from sleep, the metaphor implies that also we will awake from death. And it's called the resurrection. Those who have fallen asleep. In other words, it paints it in a temporary fashion. They are sleeping, but there will be an awakening, a resurrection. Wonderful. He says, I would not have you ignorant. Why? Notice this. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Those who are unbelieving or perhaps Christians who are untaught about these things, they don't perhaps share the living hope that we all deserve to have because of what Christ has done. We must be taught so that we can have that blessed assurance. And when we had the memorial for Roger and when we're going to have the memorial for Dawn Smedley, oh, how hope will be mixed in with with that time of mourning. It's a strange combination, isn't it? And yet we have that as believers, this, this hope, this longing, this yearning, e- e- even a capacity to, to have joy because of what we believe to be true. Certainly we miss our brothers and sisters as they pass on, but it does not take away from our hope. And our hope gives us such a capacity for those difficult times. A hope that looks beyond the grave. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, okay, do you believe that? If you believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. And and God will come back for his own at the rapture, and then he will come back with his own at, at the full second coming. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until his coming of the Lord would by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, he's saying, Paul is saying, we who are alive, now Paul is dead now, but when he wrote it, he was alive. So he's saying, we who are alive and those who sleep. And we could say, you say, say the same. He's saying, listen, don't be concerned about those who sleep, those who are buried, for, for the, um, we who are alive and remain will not proceed those who are asleep. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ, those who sleep in Christ, will rise first. And then we who remain, verse 16, 17, we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So he's giving an order, if you like. Those who have died in Christ will rise first, and then we who are alive will be caught up and we will meet them in the air. And then we will forever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So the rapture is how we are delivered from wrath. We understand that. Thus we will ever always be with the Lord. What an amazing phrase that is. And that's what makes heaven the most wonderful place that it will be, is that truth. 
we shall always be with the Lord. And it will be a wonderful reunion of believers, past, present, and future. And we together will always be with the Lord. And that's why verse 18 says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. That this would impart a comfort to us as we consider this and believe this and look to this truth. That we are comforted. Listen, we can be comforted in our trials, in our difficulties, in our challenges, in the tribulations, in physical sicknesses, in the loss of loved ones, in in world pandemics and trials and wars and everything. We can be greatly comforted in this, that there will be a day when you will close your eyes in death and open them in the presence of the Lord. And then you will be with Him always forever. And if you pass on before me or I pass on before you, oh, we will mourn in that day. But we will rejoice that you had a living faith, that you had a living hope that was resting in these incredible promises that are before us today. And then the last phrase at the end of chapter 5, and it's another prayer. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, he is emphasizing the work of sanctification that is taking place in us. And that work is progressive. It won't be complete until the Lord actually comes back and then our sanctification will be completed in that moment of bodily resurrection. But nevertheless, we have that glorious opportunity that will be um, assessed at the Bema Seat judgment of being sanctified uh, by his grace and by his word. That he might establish our hearts blameless. That he might sanctify you completely. At the parousia, at the rapture, at the coming of the Lord, we will be found that way in his eyes. Amen.